These are unusual ways people have fought climate change. Green beer, not like you drink on St. Patrick's Day, but the kind that's helping the environment. So we're happy to have a beer, have a chat, change the world. In 2021, Young Henry's Brewery in Australia used green algae to make an environmentally friendly version of beer. The algae is just part of the production process. It never touches the beer. This is not green beer. Whew. Okay, so why algae? During the beer's fermentation process, carbon dioxide is released. That algae stops the greenhouse gas from going into the atmosphere. Basically, the CO2 is then ingested by the microalgae that uses it to photosynthesize. That creates more algae, releases oxygen, and the world is a better place for it. For combating climate change, algae capture CO2 up to 400 times more efficiently than tree. The carbon dioxide emitted to make a six pack of beer can take a tree one to two days to absorb. Young Henry's beer is also working on another way greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere. This is the uh, grain left over from the brewing process. This currently goes out as cattle feed. Putting algae into food for cows reduces the methane gas cattle released in burps and farts, according to scientists. Trifecta, doing some good around climate change, uh, making small changes, improving the taste of the beer, if anything, and uh, yeah, really just doing the bits. Cows have gotten a bad rap because their methane-rich gas has been shown to greatly contribute to climate change. In 2021, scientists in Northern Ireland tried to reduce methane emissions by changing what is put in cattle feed. Seaweed um, additives can reduce methane substantially in ruminants. In particular, the a red seaweed um, has been shown to reduce methane by 80%. Seaweed has been tested to see if it can make a difference in the methane gas let out by cattle, sheep, deer, goats and giraffes. What we are trying to get to by 2030 is to actually reduce methane by 30% from ruminants. There are reportedly about 1 billion cows in the world, and each head of livestock can produce between 250 and 500 liters of methane per day. We have to solve climate change. We cannot keep on going um, in the direction that we're going in. That crumbly rock is one of the byproducts of climate change. It's called glacial rock flour, and it's left behind by receding glaciers in Greenland. Those glaciers are shrinking from warmer temperatures, a result of human-caused climate change. Tons of glacial rock flour are created every year, and the rock flour is good for the environment. The nutrient-rich stuff can be added to farmland as fertilizer, and scientists say when the rock flour dissolves in rainwater, it undergoes a chemical reaction that allows it to lock in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. CO2 is one of the main greenhouse gas culprits responsible for climate change. One small island is pledging to do its part to fight the climate crisis. There has to be a change at some stage, and we need to do it sooner rather than later, because, I mean, you just see with the news of the fires in the world and the heating up of things, possibly sea temperatures rising, you know, it's, it's not looking too good at the moment. Tiny Rothland Island off the coast of Northern Ireland says it will become carbon neutral by the end of the decade. Rothland, home to about 150 people, is well suited for its climate change initiative. It's only been on the electrical grid since 2007, and it's home to an environmentally friendly kelp farming industry. The thing about kelp is you grow it in the sea, you don't need any fertilizers or any pesticides or any herbicides. In fact, the more you grow, the better it is for the environment. Rothland is also putting stock in hydrogen power. There's great possibilities now with hydrogen-fueled ferries, um, and we can produce hydrogen on Rothland. So, I mean, that achieves two goals. It, it reduces our carbon footprint, hopefully to zero, but it also gives us some security in that we're generating our own energy um, and retailing our own energy. What we're trying to do is to create a net that catches us as a species, for all the species on Earth, for our atmosphere, for having what we call a living biosphere. Eric Dennerstein is a conservation biologist. In 2020, he headed up a team that put together a roadmap and a literal map 
for saving our planet and its species from global warming. It's called the Global Safety Net. A map that basically says, here are the places that we need to set aside for conservation. What we're suggesting for the biodiversity side is to agree to set aside roughly half of the planet for conservation, and we live on the other half. By setting aside that half for conservation, we not only solve the problem of climate change, but we also provide enough land for other species to, to live with us, to coexist. We also prevent the possibility of future pandemics from occurring. The safety net calls for habitats to be connected. What would it look like for all the intact habitats and national parks of the world to be connected by corridors so species can move from A to B to C if the climate shifts? Um, over the next 10, 20, 30, 100 years. If we don't save species, we won't save the habitats. They're interdependent, and we don't want to see more pandemics. So we have to protect the tropical forests that are the breeding grounds for these. Achieving the global safety net may sound like a monumental task, but it's not as tough as we think. Right now, about 15%, almost one third of the way there, is already protected by governments and by federal, state, local, whatever, around the world. So that's a good start. And it's also affordable. We've done an estimate. We think it would cost about $100 billion a year to erect and maintain the safety net because we don't have much time to waste. If we wait 20 years, it will be too late. We have the power to envision a world that is much better than what we have now. For Inside Edition Digital, I'm Andreas Wendell.